So hello and welcome back once again to channel 514 and SPK Plus. And if you watched our last episode, then you already know that we are reading through the tale of Sinuhe, the great epic of the Middle Kingdom, really the great epic of all of ancient Egyptian civilization, and that this is part of our series exploring ancient literature. So what happened in our last episode? What have we covered in the story so far? Well, Sinuhe, our main character, who is he? He is an official in the royal government under King Amenemhet I, who founded the 12th dynasty, which is probably the dynasty under which our story was written. So this king dies, and his son accedes to the throne, and Sinuhe is either somehow involved in a conspiracy, although I don't read it that way, or he is somehow knowledgeable of it, or he knows people who are involved in it, and so he is afraid of what might happen, and he thinks that some things he said might be taken out of context, and so he flees to Palestine, where he wins a great he wins victories he becomes a close associate of the chief who rules over this part of palestine this district called upper retenu and he then has a sort of david and goliath episode of a single combat in which he defeats the champion of a rival tribe of these local people and so He's living in a foreign land, and he has it all, but what he really wants, as it turns out, is to go home and live in Egypt where a civilized man should live, and be buried there, and get all of the funerary honors and all of that stuff. So, And he wants to be reconciled with the new king, from whom he's been alienated since that king acceded to the throne. So... His desire becomes known to the king, and the king issues an edict. And so Sinuhe then replies, and so the part that we're getting into in our story that we're about to read, we're going to read the last five pages or so, it's very nice really, it's a, uh, it's a homecoming story, so that's where we're headed. And if I could just get up for one moment and check on something, because I'm getting some kind of message on my phone back there. Okay, thanks for your patience there. Now we'll get right into this. So, as I mentioned last time, each section of the text has a name that our translator gives to it just for convenience's sake. And so this next one that I'm going to read is called The Royal Edict, in which the king is writing to Sinuhe, or decreeing that he can come home. So, copy of the decree brought to this servant regarding his being brought back to Egypt. The Horus, life of births, the two ladies, life of births, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Keper Kare, son of Re, Senwosret, living forever. The decree of the king to the follower Sinuhe. This decree of the king is brought to you to inform you that you have traversed the foreign countries and have come forth from Kedem to Retenu. By your heart's counsel to you, land has, been gi uh, land has given you to land. What have you done that one should act against you? You have not blasphemed that one should reprove your words. You have not spoken in the council of the elders that one should reproach your speech. This idea of yours, it took over your senses, although there was nothing in my mind against you. This heaven of yours, which is in the palace, she is well, and she flourishes today as in her former state in the kingship of the land, with her children in the audience hall. 
You shall pile up the treasures which they give you, and you shall live off their bounty. Come back to Egypt, and you shall see the capital in which you were born. You shall kiss the ground at the great double gate, and you shall associate with the companions. Today, old age has begun for you, and potency has left you. Think about the day of burial, the passing over to an honored state. The night will be appointed for you with oils and poultices from the arms of Tayet, goddess of weaving. A procession will be made for you on the day of interment, the anthropoid sarcophagus overlaid with gold leaf, the head with lapis lazuli, and the sky above you as you are placed in the outer coffin and dragged by teams of oxen preceded by singers. The dance of the muu will be performed at your tomb, and the necessary offerings will be invoked for you. They will slaughter at the entrance of your tomb chapel, your pillars to be set up in limestone, as is done for the royal children. You shall not die in a foreign land, and Asiatics will not escort you. You shall not be placed in a ram skin as they make your grave. All of this is too much for one who has roamed the earth. Take thought for your dead body and return. So the next section, Sinuhe's reaction and his reply. It was while I was standing in the midst of my tribe that this decree reached me. It was after I had prostrated myself and touched the ground that it was read to me. I spread it out, the dirt, over my chest. Then I went about my encampment rejoicing and saying, How could such a thing be done for a servant whose sense led him astray to the land of the barbarians? Indeed, your benevolence is excellent, O oh, you who have saved me from death. Your ka will allow me to... Sp uh, spend the end of my life with my body in the capital. Copy of the reply to this decree. The servant of the palace, Sinuhe, says, In peace, in peace. This flight which this servant did in his ignorance is well known by your Ka, O good God, Lord of the two lands, whom Re loves, and whom Montu, Lord of Thebes, favors, as well as Amun, Lord of the thrones of the two lands, Sobek Re, Lord of Sumenu, Horus, Hathor, all the gods of Egypt, Atum and his Aeneid, Sopdu, Neferbau, Semseru, Horus the Easterner, the mistress of Yemet, may she unfold your head, the council upon the flood waters. Min Horus in the midst of the desert lands, Wereret, the mistress of Punt, Nut, Haoreis Re, and the gods who are the lords of the beloved land, and the islands of the great green. They give life and prosperity to your nostrils. They grant you their bounty. They give you eternity without its end, and everlastingness without its limit. Fear of you is repeated in the lowlands and in the highlands, for all that the sun disc encircles is conquered for you. Such is the prayer of this servant to his Lord who has rescued him from the West. Lord of perception, who perceives the people, may he perceive in the majesty of the palace that this servant was afraid to speak, it is a serious matter to repeat. The great God, a likeness of Re, knows the mind of one who has inquired after him of his own accord. For this servant is in the hands of someone who takes thought for him. I am set in his guidance. Your majesty is the conquering Horus. Your arms prevail over all lands. May now your majesty command that there be brought Mekhi from Kedem, Kentu Wash from out of Keshu, and Menus, those who set your authority over the lands of the Fenku. They are rulers whose names are worthy, and who have been brought up in your love. Not to mention Retenu, for it belongs to you, even as your hounds. This flight which your servant made, it was not premeditated. It was not in my mind. I did not prepare it. I cannot say what separated me to this country. It was like a dream, as when a Delta man sees himself in Elephantine, or a man of the marshlands, in Nubia. Yet I was not afraid. No one chased me. I did not hear a word of censure. No one heard my name in the mouth of the town crier, except that my body cringed, my feet scurried, and my senses overwhelmed me, with the god who decreed this flight drawing me on. I was not stubborn before. A man is modest when his homeland is known, for Ray has placed the fear of you throughout the land, and the dread of you in every foreign land. Whether I am in the capital or in this place, yours is everything which is covered by this horizon. The sun disk rises at your bidding and the water of the river is drunk if you wish. The air of the heavens is breathed if you speak. Now that this servant has been sent for, this servant will hand over his property to his children, whom he has engendered in this place. 
May your majesty act as he wishes, for one lives by the air which you give. Ray, Horus, and Hathor, love your noble nostrils, which Montu, lord of Thebes, wishes that they live forever. So, the king sends a message that Sinuhe should return, and that he's, uh, there's nothing being held against him, and that he must have had a false notion that he was in trouble of some kind to have fled, and so Sinuhe writes back that, of course, he really wants to come back, and he didn't leave out of a sense of guilt or because of some discontent or in a premeditated way, but in an agitated state of mind, he, as if led by a god, he suddenly decided to flee. So the next uh, passage is called uh, Sinuhe's Return. I was allowed to spend a day in Ya'a to transfer my goods to my children. My eldest son was in charge of my tribe. My tribe and all my possessions were in his hands, as well as all my serfs, my cattle, my fruit, and all my productive trees. This servant proceeded south. I halted at the ways of Horus. The commander in charge of the patrol there sent a message to the capital to give them notice. His Majesty had them send a capable overseer of field laborers of the royal estate, and with him ships laden with presents of the royal bounty, for the Asiatics who had come with me to lead me to the ways of Horus. I called each one of them by name. Each servant was at his task. I started out and raised sail. Dough was needed and strained for beer beside me until I reached the wharf of Ichtawi which it says here is a frontier station on the border of Egypt, as you can guess. So the next section is called Sinuhe at the Palace. When dawn came and it was morning, I was summoned. Ten men came, and ten men went to usher me to the palace. I touched my forehead to the ground between the sphinxes. The royal children were standing in the gateway to meet me. The companions who showed me into the pillared court set me on the way to the reception hall. I found his majesty upon the great throne, set in a recess paneled with fine gold. As I was stretched out on my belly, I lost consciousness in his presence. This god addressed me in a friendly way, and I was like a man caught by nightfall. My soul fled, and my body shook. My heart was not in my body. I could not tell life from death. His majesty said to one of these companions, Lift him up and let him speak to me. And his majesty said, See, you have returned. Now that you have roamed the foreign lands, exile has ravaged you. You have grown old. Old age has caught up with you. The burial of your body is no small matter. For now, you will not be escorted by the bowmen. Do not creep any more. You do not speak when your name was called out. You shall not fear punishment. It was with a timorous reply that I answered, What has my lord said to me? If I try to answer, there is no shortcoming on my part toward God. It is fear which is in my body, like that which brought to pass the fated flight. I am in your presence. Life belongs to you. May your majesty do as he wishes. The royal children were then brought in, and his majesty said to the queen, Here is Sinuhe, who has returned as an Asiatic, whom the Bedouin have raised. She let out a very great cry, and the royal children shouted all together. They said before his majesty, It is not really he, O sovereign, my lord. His Majesty said, It is he indeed. Then they brought their Menyat necklaces, their rattles, and their sistra with them, and they offered them to His Majesty. May your arms reach out to something nice, O enduring King, to the ornaments of the Lady of Heaven. May the Golden One give life to your nostrils, and may the Lady of the Stars be joined to you. The crown of Upper Egypt will go northward and the crown of Lower Egypt will go southward, that they may unite and come together at the word of your majesty, and the cobra goddess Wadjet will be placed on your forehead. As you have kept your subjects from evil, so may Ray, lord of the two lands, be compassionate toward you, hail to you, and also to the lady of all. Lay to rest your javelin, set aside your arrow, give breath to the breathless, Give us this happy reward, this Bedouin chief Simei Yet, the bowman born in Egypt. It was through fear of you that he took flight, and through dread of you that he left the land. Yet there is no one whose face turns white at the sight of your face. The eye which has seen you will not be afraid. His Majesty said, 
He shall not fear. He shall not be afraid. He shall be a companion among the nobles, and he shall be placed in the midst of the courtiers. Proceed to the robing hall to wait upon him. So there's a footnote here that Si Mayet, the name that they call Sinuhe, son of the north wind, is what that means. And it's a playful variant on his real name, Sinuhe, son of the sycamore. So I suppose because he fled to Palestine, which is northeast of Egypt, then he's called son of the north wind, like he's returning with the north wind or something like that. So the very last, the very last part of the story is called Sinuhe Reinstated. So that goes like this. When I came from the robing hall, the royal children gave me their hands, and we went through the great double gate. I was assigned to the house of a king's son. Fine things were in it, a cooling room in it, and representations of the horizon. Valuables of the treasury were in it. Vestments of royal linen were in every apartment, and first-grade myrrh of the royal courtiers whom he loves. Every domestic servant was about his prescribed task. Years were caused to pass from my body. I was depilated, and my hair was combed out. A load was given to the desert, and clothes to the sand dwellers. I was outfitted with fine linen and rubbed with the finest oil. I passed the night on a bed. I gave the sand to those who live on it, and wood oil to those who rub themselves with it. A house of a plantation owner, which had belonged to a companion, was given to me. Many craftsmen were building it, and all its trees were planted anew. Meals were brought from the palace three and four times a day, in addition to what the royal children gave. There was not a moment of interruption. A pyramid of stone was built for me in the midst of the pyramids. The overseers of stone cutters of the pyramids marked out its ground plan. The draftsmen sketched in it, and the master sculptors carved in it. The overseers of works who were in the necropolis gave it their attention. Care was taken to supply all the equipment which is placed in a tomb chamber. Ka servants were assigned to me, and a funerary estate was settled on me with fields attached, at my mooring place, as is done for a companion of the First Order. My statue was overlaid with gold leaf, its apron in electrum. It was His Majesty who ordered it to be done. There was no commoner for whom the like had ever been done. So I remained in the favor of the king, until the day of mooring came. Its beginning has come to its end, as it has been found in writing. And then it says here, the traditional colophon marks the end of the story. So Sinuhe comes home, and he's restored to favor in the royal court, where he's been greatly missed, and so... A pyramid, not of course a great pyramid like you would see at Giza or Saqqara, but some kind of small pyramid reminiscent of the big ones, is built for him as a tomb, which was sometimes done in the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom and, and later, so um, although it wasn't any kind of general rule that that should be done, but in any case he gets a pyramid, so so... That's our story, and as I said before, the real point of it is about this man fleeing from Egyptian civilization, which is treated as, in characteristic Egyptian style, it's treated as the only civilization, or the greatest of them, or the only one worthy of the name, and he flees from it, and so he eventually comes back because he knows that's what what's right and so so in a sense Egypt rediscovers itself or the Egyptian man rediscovers his identity or um, his civilization or however you want to think of that so that is the tale of Sinuhe so I don't think there's anything more that I really want to say about that besides what I already said in the first video before beginning. So thanks for joining us on this, and where we'll go from here is either, I haven't really decided yet, but either into 
some of the later fictional or narrative literature from later periods or into royal decrees or wisdom literature or in any case we have a few choices and there are a few more neighborhoods in Egyptian literature for us to explore before we move on into Greek and Roman literature. So thanks for joining us for this and wherever we go next time um, you know where to find me and I'll see you there. So thanks again and have a great day.